Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation, where it is always a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Chalice UU is a community of diverse beliefs and experiences where we nurture the religious liberal spirit and are united by our, our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, who, whomever you love, and whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, or if this is your very first time, we are so glad to have you with us. I'm Jessica Schultz, and I'll be the worship associate today. And I'm thrilled to announce that our pulpit guest this morning is Reverend Elizabeth Buki Saunter, and she'll be joining us from Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, preaching live, not live, using video. Many of you will remember Reverend Elizabeth from the time she spent back with us a few years. It doesn't seem like it could be that far back, but it was 2014 to 2017. She has been the called and settled minister at First Church in Jamaica Plain since she left us in 2017. Her subject today is What Would Mr. Rogers Do? Today's musician is John Schultz, and our song leader is Laura Brown. Our tech team is Hope Campbell and Dean Gadet, and our greeters, our, our greeter, I believe, is Shannon Anderson, doing, doing the job all by herself. I think that's a little, I think that means we need more greeters, guys. Our minister, Sharon Wiley, Reverend Sharon Wiley will return to the pulpit next Sunday on the 21st to share life lessons from a Padre fan. And I think that means you can wear your Padre gear, so come on down. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Welcome to those of us here, you, those of you here in the chapel, and welcome to those of you joining us on Zoom. For those of you here in the chapel, please feel free to wear masks or step outside as needed for your comfort. You can hear what's happening when you're outside on the courtyard. 
We're always thrilled to have newcomers joining us. And as a newcomer, you might be interested in some of the groups and activities we offer, which can be found in our email newsletter and e-news calendar. Whether online or in person, we hope you'll share your email address with us so that you can receive those weekly emails. And now, let's take a breath together. A land acknowledgement is an honest and historically accurate way to recognize the traditional First Nations of a place. It commemorates Indigenous peoples' principal kinship to the land and the fact that they have not been and cannot be erased from their collective First Mother, the land. It is a starting place to change how the land is seen and talked about, according to Wanda Nanibush of the Anishinaabekwe Nation in Ontario. For non-Indigenous communities, a land acknowledgement is a powerful way of showing respect and honor for the Indigenous people of the land on which we work and live. It is a way of resisting the erasure of Indigenous histories and working towards honoring and inviting the truth. It is a stepping stone to honoring broken treaty relationships. It is an act of reconciliation. Land acknowledgements are not about placing blame, nor are they intended to restore white comfort. They are prayerful, they are personal, with carefully chosen and accurate language. In honoring indigenous peoples, we strive to learn the pronunciation of their names. Land acknowledgements recognize how systemic and institutional systems of power have oppressed indigenous people, and how that oppression has historically influenced the way non-indigenous peoples perceive and interact with them in the past as well as in the present. And so, I offer this land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that I live, work, and raise my family on stolen land, the ancestral homeland of the Payamkuichim and the Kumeyaay nations, a people who have been living, working, and raising families on this land of their ancestors for countless generations people who have an enduring connection to this land that can never be erased, people for whom their deep relationship with this land of their ancestors is inseparable from who they are, people who consider this land and everything around them to be part of their enduring family. And now we will light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Uh, Melissa V will light our chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting words today come from Reverend Tom Goldsmith, who served the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City for 34 years. And he used this chalice lighting to begin his worship, the worship every Sunday. Symbol of light and knowledge symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Hello. sing along. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. If the road looks rough ahead and you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed. But just remember what your old pal said. Yes, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got troubles, well, I got them too. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. 
We stick together and we see it through. Yes, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Some other folks might be a little bit smarter than I am, a little bit stronger too. But none of them will ever love you the way I do. It's me and you, boy. And as the years go by, our friendship will never die. You're going to see it's our destiny. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. of our call to worship this morning come from Andrew Pakula. Come into the circle of community. Come into the sacred space. Be not tentative. Bring your whole self. Bring the joy that makes your heart sing. Bring your kindness and your compassion. Bring also your sorrow and your pain. Bring your brokenness and your disappointments. Spirit of love and mystery, help us to recognize the spark of the divine that resides within each and every one of us. May we know the joy of wholeness. May we know the joy of being together. Please rise in body or spirit to join in singing. singing uh, hymn Loosen Loosen. It's our hymn of the month and we're singing it every Sunday through the month of July so that we can learn it better. Um, you see the word. There are two kind of themes. The first theme we'll sing through twice and the second theme we'll sing through twice and then we'll go back to the first theme and sing that twice. I'll let you know. and loose and baby you don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones let go let go let go again loose and loose and baby you don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones let go
our Sunday worship is the sacred spiritual practice of our community. And we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring joys and sorrows. Here in the chapel, please write your joy or sorrow onto a candle card, which Julia Fogel, who I forgot to mention, is helping today. She's the assistant, a very important job, uh, and she will collect your candle cards from you. Online, please write your joy or sorrow, including your name, into the chat box. Although these joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud today, we will remove this part of the service from the recording that goes on our YouTube channel. So this sharing won't be publicly available. If you would like to send Reverend Sharon a confidential note about your joy or sorrow, or to make a prayer request, please email her. Her email address will be on the screen in a moment. We'll enjoy some music while you write down what you'd like to share so that in the sharing, your burden is lessened and your joy is multiplied.
Our story today is called Be Kind by Pat Zietlow Miller and illustrated by Jen Hill. Tanisha spilled grape juice yesterday all over her new dress. Everyone laughed. I almost did too, but mom always tells me to be kind, so I tried. I don't think it worked. I said, purple is my favorite color. I thought Tanisha would smile, but she ran into the hall instead. When she came back, snack time was over. She put on her art smock and didn't look at anyone. I almost told Tanisha that art was my favorite class, but I didn't want her to leave again. So I painted purple splotches and added some green until I had a bunch of beautiful violets. While I painted, I thought about Tanisha. Should I have handed her my napkin? Let her borrow my sweatshirt? Spilled my juice so everyone stared at me instead? What does it mean to be kind anyway? Maybe it's giving, making cookies for Mr. Rinaldi, who lives alone. Letting someone with smaller feet have my too tight shoes. He might win races in them too. Maybe it's helping, putting dirty dishes in the sink. Cleaning up after Otis, our class guinea pig. He's a messy eater. Maybe it's paying attention, telling Desmond I like his blue boots, asking the new girl to be my partner. Listening to Aunt Franny's stories, even the ones I've heard before. Being kind should be easy, like throwing away a wrapper or recycling a bottle, or saying thank you and bless you. My mom says the quickest way to be kind is to use people's names. Hey, Carla. What's new, Omar? Good afternoon, Rabbi Mandelbaum. Being kind can be hard, too, even when you know what to do. Teaching someone something I'm good at is tricky, even when I'm patient. And sticking up for someone when other kids aren't kind is really hard and really scary. Maybe I can't solve Tanisha's grape juice problem. Maybe all I can do is sit by her in art class and paint this picture for her because I know she likes purple too. Maybe I can only do small things, but my small things might join small things other people do. And together, they could grow into something big, something really big, so big that all our kindnesses spill out of our school, spread throughout town, travel across the country, and go all the way around the world. right back to Tanisha and me, so we can be kind again. And again, and again. Our story. As the children leave her classes, we join in. Reverend Elizabeth, Elizabeth Buki Saunter joined the UU Church in Jamaica Plain as its minister, as I said earlier, in 2017. A lifelong Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist, Reverend E.B., as she refers to herself on their website, has a Master of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary in New York 
and is, is in full fellowship with the Unitarian Universalist Association's Ministerial Fellowship Committee. She joined First Church from San Diego, California, where she worked at Chalice UU Congregation and interned with First Church, Church, First Church of San Diego. Reverend E.B. is a proud lesbian and lives in Malden with her wife, Isabel, her rambunctious rescue dog, Liuba, and two brave cats, Doppler and Houdini. She is sustained by prayer, singing, and plenty of chocolate. From The World According to Mr. Rogers by Fred Rogers. All of us, at some time or other, need help. Whether we're giving or receiving help, each of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors. In our own way, each one of us is a giver and a receiver. As human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how rare and valuable each one of us really is that each of us has something that no one else has or ever will have, something inside that is unique to all time. It is our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. Its expression. Hello, Chalice. Greetings from hot and muggy Massachusetts to hot and what I understand is slightly less muggy Escondido. I have put my sweater on on this hot day because it reminds me of Fred Rogers, a person many of us knew as Mr. Rogers. He was famous to a lot of us uh, who are between the ages of about 50 and 26, or people who had little kids between about 1969 and 2001. He was the creator and the host of the television show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The show was for little kids. And I'm talking about it today because even though some of us, maybe most of us aren't little kids anymore, even if we are grown-ups or big kids, I think we can still learn really valuable things from the good things we liked when we were little. Mr. Rogers talked very slowly and very gently about things that mattered, including our feelings, the feelings of children. He knew that kids feel sometimes really scared and really mad, and that was okay. He told us, I like you just the way you are. He also taught us about being kind to our neighbors. If you're familiar at all with Mr. Rogers, you know that the concept of being a neighbor is at the heart of his work. Every week he sang, I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you and would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? And Mr. Rogers used the concept of the neighborhood, literally, and as a metaphor for the full human community. He said, quote, neighbors are people who are close to us and close to our hearts. So if you watch the show, you know that people in the neighborhood were sometimes portrayed as literal neighbors, people who lived and worked near to each other the speedy delivery man, the owner of the music shop, the chef, the cleaner, the singing neighborhood policeman. And Mr. Rogers was clear that the invitation to be a neighbor was for everyone. So one article I read pointed out, he, he didn't address the audience as children or girls and boys, but always as neighbor. And when asked the meaning of won't you be my neighbor? He once said, well, I suppose it's an invitation, an invitation for somebody to be close to you. 
Rogers had a simple but radical understanding of how we live into that invitation, how we practice being good neighbors. First, we must each know that we are loved just the way we are, unique and special. We must be curious about the ways each and every person we meet is also precious and valuable and has something good inside. Quote, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing, that when we look for what's best in the person we happen to be with at that moment, we're doing what God does. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we're participating in something truly sacred. End quote. We must also be honest about our feelings and practice expressing them in healthy ways. And then from a place of appreciation for ourselves and others, we can extend kindness and help to one another. It is not surprising that the concept of loving your neighbor was central to Fred Rogers. He was, as you may know, an ordained Presbyterian minister. And the biblical commandment to love your neighbor as yourself was clearly central to his ministry, as it is in both Christianity and Judaism. In this framework, a neighbor is not a fixed identity or something defined by being near you, but an action, as in the Christian story of the Good Samaritan, where the true neighbor is not just somebody nearby, but somebody who provides both inner compassion and tangible help to someone who needs it. Fred Rogers' concept of a neighbor, and I guess mine now, uh, draws on this framework of both inner care and outward help. So being a good neighbor is something we can all do. And it's a relationship of mutuality, not of patronage. Remember, quote, all of us at some time or other need help. Whether we're giving or receiving help, each one of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors. In our own way, each of us is a giver and a receiver." End quote. So being a neighbor does not only mean doing nice things for someone else, it also means receiving those things, understanding that it is good and healthy to rely on one another. That can be hard for some of us, but our neighbors are those who help us and whom we help, which if you get down far enough, can really be everyone, can be the whole human community. In his 2002 Dartmouth commencement address, Fred Rogers said, our world hangs like a magnificent jewel in the vastness of space. Every one of us is a part of that jewel, a facet of that jewel. And in the perspective of infinity, our differences are infinitesimal. We are intimately related. May we never even pretend that we are not." End quote. Confession. When I was a kid, Mr. Rogers was kind of, honestly kind of boring to me. My conscious memories are of liking other shows much more. His show was so slow and gentle that it was so easy to dismiss so easy to parody. But his emphasis on loving our neighbor and finding the specialness in each other was also deeply countercultural for the time. Some of you may know the story of Francois Clemens, a black Grammy winning musician and actor who played Officer Clemens, the singing police officer on Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. He was also a gay man closeted for the time that he was on the show. And by the way, he's been a member of a UU congregation in Vermont for many years. In 1969, as the United States faced racist violence and conflict at a time when swimming pools were explicitly racially segregated, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood presented the following scene. Rogers is sitting with his feet in a wading pool when Officer Clemens comes by. Rogers invites Clemens to join him in cooling off. Officer Clemens says, well, that seems nice, but he doesn't have a towel. To which Mr. Rogers says, well, you can share mine. And they sit there like friends, like 
neighbors. The camera zooms in on their feet, dark skin and light skin. They dry their feet with the same towel. Roger says, great to live in a neighborhood with special people like Officer Clemens. The show was making a statement without making a statement, doing it instead with embodied, tangible action. And you can read in many places about the impact of that moment, particularly on white people who said later that that scene deeply challenged their explicit racism. In 1993, when Clemens returned to the show, they recreated the scene. That time, Mr. Rogers helped Officer Clemens, Mr. Clemens, dry off his feet. And Clemens says that the two of them discussed how the gesture echoed a Bible story describing Jesus washing his disciples' feet, a symbol of respect and honor and humility. Quote, the significance of Fred doing that for a black gay man is not lost, Clemens said, la said later. And while Mr. Rogers was certainly not perfect, I mean, among other things, he reportedly didn't want Clemens to come out while he was on the show. Remember that 1993 was a time of explicitly homophobic panic about AIDS. Many straight white people needed reminding that we are all neighbors, that we are all intimately related. Being a neighbor is not a fixed identity, but an action or a series of actions. If Mr. Rogers were on the air today, I wonder if his show would do something like show him being a neighbor by offering refugee neighbors from Haiti a place to sleep in the living room of the neighborhood instead of at Boston's Logan Airport, where so many have been forced to stay for a lack of other shelter. Or Mr. Rogers might be asking a drag queen to come and tell a story and listening with his characteristic care and curiosity. Maybe he would make up a song about how some people use different pronouns and that's great. Or maybe he would help children process their feelings about having a parent with substance use disorder. And it's more important for my purposes today, sermon purposes, to remember that we can do those kinds of things. We can turn to our neighbors who need help with curiosity and care especially when the culture says we shouldn't, especially when it says, well, not, not those people. We can remember that we are special and valuable, especially when the dominant culture says that we aren't. And we can expect and ask for kindness, curiosity, and help. And we can, so we can be neighbors, good neighbors, literally and metaphorically, I love a metaphor, as individuals, as families, as a community, and as congregations that are part of our wider neighborhoods, right? So we can be neighbors by building deeper relationships with the people literally next to us on Sunday morning, maybe, or the people literally close to the church or the neighborhoods where you live. We can also be neighbors metaphorically by practicing appreciation, by looking for what's best in the person we happen to be with at the moment. We can be neighbors by practi uh, practicing uh, kindness and respect, like in using people's correct pronouns and seeking out time to practice if that's challenging. We can be neighbors by practicing giving, receiving, and asking for help. Like I said, that can be hard for many of us. Maybe we can do things like help each other with grocery shopping or errands. I'm very mindful. I have a lot of friends and congregants with young children. Uh, so I wonder about um, people who aren't actively parenting young children doing things like offering to take care of kids at church, at uh, church events, so parents can get a break, things like that. We can also think about ways that our congregations can be good neighbors. That's been a theme at the congregation I serve over the last year. Um, one of the ways we were doing that was to learn about Judaism and anti-Semitism and Christian normativity so that we could be better neighbors to the synagogue that we share space with. 
and showing up for a neighboring church, which was a year ago targeted by homophobic vandalism. And we showed up and danced with them at what they called a big gay dance party uh, on their lawn as they absolutely refused to back down from their conviction that, as they would say, God loves queer and trans people and that God's love is unconditional. That church, I think, also was a good neighbor uh, in their response to this vandalism, which was, among other things, to ask that any interested and concerned people who wanted to give a financial donation not give it to themselves, not to the church, but instead to local organizations working with queer youth and supporting uh, liberation and freedom for trans people in our state. Being a good neighbor isn't always exactly easy, but it is also within reach for all of us. We can remember we are loved and valuable. We can remember everyone else is too and look for the good inside each other. We can help and be helped even when it's a little hard. As Fred Rogers said, even though no human being is perfect, we always have the chance to bring what's unique about us to live in a redeeming way. So let's do it. Won't you be my neighbor? Please rise, Please rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. <laughs> Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. A quote from Fred Rogers, we live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say it's not my child, not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond and I consider those people my heroes. We encourage you to text your donation to Chalice. If you haven't texted a donation before, once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with the link and you enter your card information. And if you've, you're making that donation as part of your pledge payment, be sure to write pledge after the dollar amount. The phone number for text donations will be on the screen in just a moment. If you prefer to make an in-person donation of cash or check, we have a nice little box over there next to the doors and uh, some envelopes and you can leave your donations after the service. Please give generously.
Chalice, you, you congregation, congregation, our mission is to inspire, inspire individual and communal Hello again. Hello again. <laughs> um, so, 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 found a song by a uh, songwriter I'd never heard before. Her name is uh, Anne Buge. And uh, Anne didn't start really uh, writing music and writing songs, so she was in her late 50s. And, uh, but you know, she, she was around music all her life uh, and uh, has, has written some very nice songs that really fit well. She's, she's not a UU, but it's one of those people who isn't a UU, but they are. Right? <laughs> So this song is called We All Belong, and of course there's a part for you. That's not really good. Um. It's coming. Okay. Uh, there it is. It, so it goes, your part goes. So this is me, I go, it's you and uh, you and you and you and me, and then you say, we all belong. You and you and you and me, we all belong. One more time. You and you and you and me, we all belong. That's it. Where do I belong? What do I belong to? What belongs to me? And when the rhythm's wrong, what can I do to bring back harmony? Open your eyes, open your mind with a grateful heart and you can see the web of life and how you play your part. There's a place where we all belong. We are called to life by love. And there's a point when a picture forms if you stand back far enough. Like a million threads in a fantasy of interwoven destiny. You and you, and you and me, we all belong. You and you, and you and me, we all belong. Very good. Ripples from a stone spread across the pool to reach the farthest shore. And every single thought Every single word, actions even more. Leave their tiny marks, be they light or dark. No one walks alone. And each of us must make our way as we help each other home. There's a truth that includes us all when judgment fades away. And there's a love deep in every heart that nothing can betray. Like a million notes in a symphony that's echoed through eternity. You and you and you and me. We all belong, you and you, and you and me, we all belong. One more time, you and you, and you and me, we all belong.
pretty good, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. These words of prayer come from Edward T. Atkinson. At this quiet time, and in this place of worship, we would seek to know more deeply what it means to love one another. We know so well our own needs. We know that we ourselves need understanding, affection, and recognition. Why is it then that so often we hesitate to extend those precious gifts to others? The cost of a kind word is small. The moment that it takes to listen could hardly be better used. The gesture of forgiveness can mark a new beginning. An embrace or a note of appreciation can convey crucial encouragement and comfort. And yet, so often we fail with our, within our own families to live by the sacred command that we should love one another. O oh, spirit of life and love, Strengthen our faith, increase our resolve to give more generously of ourselves. We pray for the courage to take the risks of love. We pray for the insight to see ourselves and others in perspective. We pray for humility and understanding that we may always stand ready to forgive and begin anew. Amen. You are invited to join in singing. Sing number 315, This Old World. This is a new one for many of us, so I think John's going to play it through once. Closing words today also come from Fred Rogers. In the external scheme of things, shining moments are as brief as the twinkling of an eye. Yet such twinklings are what eternity is made of. Moments when we human beings can say, I love you, I'm proud of you, and I forgive you. And I'm grateful for you. That's what eternity is made of. Invisible, imperishable, good stuff. Love and blessings to each of you. You are invited to close our time together by singing the well. And after our closing hymn, we'll have the social hour in the courtyard and online. I look forward to greeting you at the chapel doors to hear how the service was meaningful for you.
Justice. 